Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I just got, uh, I mean, like, an important point on the, um, I'm Kamal from South Africa, by the way. Uh -huh. um, and on that 8.5 billion uh, US dollar deal, yep. um, I don't know if you know the terms and conditions of it, but I don't, and I can't no. find it on the internet, no. right? No, yeah. Um, and so it's difficult to, like, I don't know, paint this picture that, like, you know, there's this new kind of uh, thing that's, been co-created between the South African state and the EU when the South African state is very much complicit uh, in, 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 uh, in quite an exploitative ener energy minerals complex, right? Yeah. So it's like, this narrative is a bit funny, I'm, I'm a bit skeptical of it, and if anyone knows where to find the terms and conditions, <laughs> please let me know, because I, I can't imagine that they're that fair. Um, so that's the first thing. Yeah. Then the second thing was th that's quite interesting is... Um, uh, how, how uh, uh, r uh, the new capital uh, uh, injections that's going into renewable energy capital, so yeah. the solar panels, the, uh, all of those kind of, all, all of that kind of uh, fixed capital, uh, is able to change the, the, geo uh, the politics of nation states. So, for example, in South Africa, we've got this very like uh, intimate relationship between uh, the inner, uh, the energy sector and the mineral sector, where the there's this like dynamic, there's this relationship that has kind of led out the trajectory of our development in a way that's kind of gotten us stuck in always investing in in energy and always investing in minerals at the expense of other like um, uh, objectives of development. Yeah. And these new, uh, it's, I think it's something to watch all over the world. Indonesia, uh, there's, there's a range of countries that really uh, uh, rely on coal, yep. where it, there's going to be changes in, in national, in, in national <coughs> politics depending on how these investments go. And I think it's a very interesting question. And if you have any insight on that second point, it would be, it would be very interesting to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And I mean, we try to. Uh, get our information from colleagues at the University of Cape Town. But of course, it's, uh, I cannot speak uh, for them. On your first point, I draw your attention on this deal with ESCOM because I see a lot of... Uh, it's, it's, the, you can build a very attractive narrative on that, uh, saying it's, uh, it's solution-driven, uh, it's uh, co-benefits, so lots of things like that. And I completely concur with you on the fact that we need to know more about the conditionalities, about the efficiency of that. Um, I've been asking uh, the French Treasury, with whom we work, um, what they think about that, uh, to what extent they thought it was a, a fair deal, should we try and... and because they said, we, we, we would like to use this as a, as a reference, not necessarily a model to be directly transferred, but as a reference for others to be inspired. And I think a lot of the things that they are mostly worried with is, of course, they don't find it really uh, unequal or unfair, um, I mean, I, I don't believe that they would have done so. They might not look, they, they might not see something there. I, I think they are quite sincere on that. But they were saying, we really need, the problem is that, are we really going to be able to deliver? Because behind the deal, there is a whole discussion on regulation of the energy sector, changes that are actually political, and that uh, are not just about pouring money, but changing uh, things in the, in the uh, structure of the economic and political system that you're just describing. So I think they are quite aware that uh, uh, but they are more worried about not delivering than, uh, the, than potential uh, side effects of the deal that would be socially uh, negative. They have the impression that what there has been, but you are a South African citizen, so you might know, you probably know much better than I do, that there had been also a consultation uh, in South Africa to build up a project of just transition out of coal uh, that was really owned by South Africa and not decided uh, in Washington or Paris. But that's, that's the conditions that I think, and, and I think we, we really, I mean, we at IDRI, you, I don't know what you're going to do next year, but we at IDRI, it's really our mission to try and analyze the terms and conditions of the contract to find it in the, I don't know, in the cupboards of the French Agency for Development who's part of the deal and analyze it critically, but also constructively, because I think there are also things that might be interesting in the deal. And I completely concur with you to some extent that was, it, it's even more important than my description of global changes in global uh, allocation of power, 
to change the domestic allocation of power with these renewable uh, changes. Um, the colleagues at the Cape Town University with whom we work, uh, just to name them so you know it's the people at the Energy Center, Harald Winkler and uh, Hilton Trollip, they uh, really tell us a story where they try to find ways to unlock the political power of that uh, sectorial uh, uh, mining and energy sectors and how they are blocking the system into uh, a carbon intensive pathway of development that is also a, a, an inequality intensive pathway of development. That's their story, huh? meaning that the mining sector is definitely also a sector that traps uh, the black population, particularly, I think, into a trap of poverty, and that we need also to try and build policies to help them exit the dependency on that sector in terms of workforce. So I'm sorry if I'm caricatural, because that's just trying to tell a story that I was told. Uh, but I think they are really uh, very, very much looking at how we could use other types of deals to try and diminish the power uh, of the coal and mining sector to lock South Africa in an unsustainable pathway of development. So they have that type, it's interesting because they are energy economists, but they are really having that political uh, strategy. I'm not sure that they are right in the strategy that they have, but they have that in mind. Um, and, and they are looking, for instance, how steel, there is going to be a lot of demand for steel in the rest of uh, Southern Africa or Sub-Saharan Africa that might be just produced by the steel industry in South Africa. And if managed well with a type of agreement like the ESCOM agreement with uh, uh, people in Europe who say, I'm going to buy your, uh, your green steel in South Africa. Uh, if, you, if you invest in green technologies uh, for production of steel, then we, again, it might be able to get that part of the sector out of the dependency on coal. So there, I'm just not saying that this is the right way forward, but that this is the type of discussion that is extremely active in, the, uh, in South Africa, and that is extremely important. But I think your point was to say, um, where capital is going to inject itself is going to change political power. And that I, I really concur with you, and we need to be uh, really looking at, at that, because that's not just uh, uh, the matter of global politics, but also domestic politics in many of the countries where coal matters. And that also explains to some extent why India was saying uh, we are going to phase, out, phase down coal and not phase out coal, because we need to be also owning the pathway and not just be imposed the pathway. So I, I appear to be very sympathetic to the uh, Indian government. I was, the, I was already in 2015. It's not that I endorse everything by the Indian government, but globally, what they do is quite uh, audacious and, and quite uh, proactive for being able to build a, a action for climate protection. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the way that they present that. And not blaming them for COP26 is very important. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the, your presentation and also thank you for being so positive. Um, <laughs> so, um, I, even though maybe it's the Friday evening, but I feel like that I am not sure if I can, like, yeah, agree with every every step in terms okay. of the, the, the first part of the, when you, especially when you were um, say, talking about the water issue and how yeah. Um, okay. You can uh, create cooperation for these issues um, among parties where there is usually conflict. And I happen to be working um, at the institute, research institute in Jerusalem. Um, I was part of filing a, a major um, application for uh, the EU on water issues. Yeah. So, um, and in that regard as far as i know there is really no like i don't want to say that there is no co um cooperation but um in terms of from the palestinian side this is they are experiencing shortages and this is um something that is being used against them strategically and i so far that as i know i can really not see an issue uh, uh, like a form of cooperation, if not the other way around. Yeah. And another example that came to my mind was not in terms of like water supply for households, um, but water that is used, being used as a weapon um, by Turkey against the Kurdish minorities in the uh, Ilisu area um, where they're, um, yeah on purpose um, 
How do you say Staudamm? Uh, them? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, but that, that's uh, the equivalent. Yes, yeah, that, that's the one I'm looking for. So, and basically they're creating the dam to flood this area on purpose to um, uh, evacuate the Kurdish population and also um, for other political re reasons with the par um, bordering countries. Yeah. So I feel that, yeah, especially water, but also in general, I can see that this is not often used as cooperation, but quite the opposite. And yeah. I yeah. just wanted to hear your opinion on that. No, no, th thanks for making me uh, be more precise about that. I think my main point here, um, I, I tried to be a little bit provocative uh, when I, di I did my PhD on water in the Mediterranean and uh, how we deal with future water scarcity. And at the end of the 90s, the, the story was uh, the, the wars of the, of, the, of the future are going to be wars on water. And I wanted to contradict that, uh, which is not necessarily, if I do it too rapidly, then I come to the contradictions that you are saying. Um, and again, just to tell you that uh, I, I maybe I don't want to, to decredibilize everything that I've been saying, but a lot of what I've been saying is not very normative or prescriptive, but rather trying to question uh, st the, the way we look at things. For instance, when we look at climate and security, let's look at these issues that we've discussed or those issues that we've discussed about the power of where capital is going to fund renewables. That might be more important than just looking at uh, climate is important for security because there are going to be the climate refugees. Uh, or because they are going to come to, to Europe, for instance. So let's try and be sometimes uh, uh, looking at the uh, opposite assumption. That was basically a lot of my talk tonight. Um, and in that way, also being optimistic is maybe just a provocation to say, why not? Well, let's look at what are the conditions for that. When I come back to water, um, you're completely right to say that uh, water, the, I mean, scarce resources uh, is political and is used strategically and politically, that's for sure. Uh, one of the things that I was trying to say is that, and then the, uh, the two examples that you take are extremely, extremely important because they are uh, not necessarily international, but they are really between communities that are not in the same nation. Uh, could say Turkish and Kurdish uh, normally should be in the same nation. Um, one of the things that I, sh that I tried to say in my, in my PhD is that before looking at uh, the political effects in terms of conflicts between nations, let's look at the political effect within nations. Tunisia, for instance, this was the country that I was studying in my PhD, I tried to say, uh, you are dealing with water, uh, but actually all the decisions that you make are about opportunities of development of different regions. If you take water from Sidi Bouzid to, to take it to Sfax, which is a, a pipeline of water that they have built for, for decades, you're actually reducing the opportunities of development of the uh, hinterland and to just, again, put more opportunities for development to the coast in the, the region of Sfax. And that is politically significant. You should not do that without understanding the political significance of that. While it seemed it was peaceful because it was within the context of one country with no specific ethnicity issues. But Sidi Bouzid is where the revolution in Tunisia actually started. So not just to say that I was right and that water matters. It was just, water was just one symptom of the unbalances of development within the country. Oh. And, and so, yes, you're right uh, about that. Uh, s thanks for having corrected me. Yes, it's going to be weaponized and politically important. Thank you for your presentation. I think it was really, really great. I really appreciate it. I just have one question. Um, I mean, more like a remark. When you were speaking about the protocol of Mo uh, moral protocol, you were saying that, uh, I, I mean, yes, it was great and it was a big change and it was um, like, you can see like, proper result of the politic, but at the same time, from what I heard, it's also because uh, they found a substitute that was mm -hmm. like um, more profitable for, for the films, like it was Dupont de Nemours, and he, he was first against that, but then he found out like there was this substitute that it was actually cheaper. Yep. So that way it's change. It's not like a cooperation that make it um, better, but it's just like because they found that they can still have profits on it. So just to highlight this point, and also I, had, I, I want just your opinion about the, um, what happened in the, uh, COP26, because um, I don't know if I remember correctly, but I think it was in Stockholm in 2009 that they, say they promised uh, 100 billion 
to from the south uh, from the north to the south and that is still not occurring in in the COP26 and we are like now I think it was like one over four um, uh, un quart, how you say? Un quart. One fourth. <laughs> one fourth, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> one fourth was uh, to the transition and it like, was basically in, like nothing was done. Uh -huh. And also, um, I don't know if you can say something about uh, the carbon markets because uh, during the COP26 they start to uh, really speak about the carbon markets, which was something that we already proved. I mean, we that they proved that uh, it wasn't efficient, and uh, that has a lot of problem. And they actually report this issue of the carbon market, but uh, with some country that already have a lot of money to use mm. Mm. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, carbon emission, which is for me doesn't make any sense. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Lots of very important questions. <clears throat> My point about the Montreal Protocol was really to say um, that if we, are, if we were able to find a solution to the climate uh, problem where would, uh, we would have the equivalent of Dupont de Nemours identifying that it's actually more profitable to be low carbon, I would go for it uh, because that would be a solution to the problem. So I'm not saying, and I'm really cynical in that. I'm just saying that. Uh, this is to me, uh, I think that's what the pragmatic American colleagues were telling Laurence Tubiana. Let's find problems where you can easily show that there are a majority of players who would actually benefit from the change and some minor players who you have to compensate. Uh, and those who gain from this process would just uh, pay the others. So I'm, I'm really not saying that it was a, a, a cooperative agreement where, where some part of the agreement, some, some party to the agreement was able to make a sacrifice, no sacrifice. But it was, it was a possible solution to the problem because you could negotiate some compensation for the companies that are not Dupont, that, I don't know, something like that. Uh, and to some extent, and this is the story that I'm not able to tell anyway, not just because it's late, it's what were the roles of governments? Because to some extent, it was not just one transnational company. There was still something about how governments also needed to agree on, on the norms and standards. Uh, and so that's, that's the part where the governments were able to find a solution because economically it was nearly uh, uh, harm, harmless for, for everybody. And then on, on COP26, two elements of, of answers. Uh, yes, the point that I was, when I was talking about the anger of the non-aligned, this was really saying in Copenhagen 20, 2009, COP15, there was the, the number was just put on the table. By 2020, public and, and, and private money from north to south would be at least uh, $100 billion uh, per year. Um, and uh, the monitoring of the OECD showed that in 2018, 2019, the number was $80 billion uh, per year. And it was plateauing, and that's, that's the problem. Um, we and other think tanks and, and governments from the south had been advocating for at least the projections, I mean the OECD is projecting that we would reach the, to the 100 billion in 2023. Uh, Macron has been saying let's at least ensure that we would have uh, over a five years period, even if we begin at 80, uh, 80 billion now, that overall the mean, the average value would be 100 billion over the, 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 five, uh, the five years. But the thing is that so I'm not completely, and so there is in the text of Glasgow uh, the fact that the northern countries deeply regret not having done it, which is really uh, not sufficient. And I would have expected a little, bit, a, little bit, a little bit more of commitments and accountability about saying that when the OECD is projecting that maybe by 2023 it would be possible to reach 100 billion, to have some kind of a monitoring mechanism that would at least name and shame and show that they are committing to more. And this is really one of the things where I see a distrust mounting and, and anger mounting between northern and southern countries. And on carbon prices, uh, I'm trying to be here to answer the last question uh, rapidly. So carbon markets, there is, there is a lot of uh, policy around that. Um, one of the key things that I think we might at, at one point need to have is that when you have an ETS in Quebec and California that are now connected, when you have an ETS systems all over China and an ETS in Europe, at some point we will need to see, to have a conversation about how we uh, have converging prices on our ETS markets. I think that's, that makes sense in terms of economics and would be 
the type of a pragmatic solution to go towards the gentil role uh, uh, idea. Uh, that's one part of the discussion that was not so much held in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Glasgow under what is called Article 6, because Article 6 is a lot about if, we, if there are things that I don't do as an enterprise in Europe, can I uh, accept to not reduce my emissions but buy a compensation from Brazil? Uh, and this system is going to be extremely controlled. I think the, in Madrid two years ago, it was just uh, Brazil and Australia was, were opposing everything. They let go a little bit of that pressure. So at least the, the worst of it that was about uh, double counting is avoided. Uh, but it's still not completely... Uh, so I think there is a lot of questions about the integrity of the whole system. Um, it's not completely perfect. You had the San Jose principles that were really saying how to make that in a way that would be completely in in integral. Uh, we're not completely there, but the outcome of COP26 is rather better than expected on that part. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I'm Francisco from Argentina. And my question is regarding exactly the point of the possibilities of international cooperation uh, between the North the Global North and the Global South, uh, considering what was just mentioned, for instance, uh, an agreement that is not um, completely uh, applied, uh, but also we could add the transfer of technologies, mm -hmm. uh, that it's, I'm, maybe it's more difficult to, to assess, but, but I think uh, the, um, the vaccine issue right now is, it could be a good opportunity as, as a gesture, also yeah. not only uh, benefiting the Global South, no, because it's clearly a problem that it's, it will come once and, uh, and again if, we, if we're not um, fully, fully prepared in, a, in every country. Yeah. Uh, and this uh, possible allocation or reallocation of power related to resources, it, it also it takes me to think in the, in the international and national, like the domestic level, because for instance, in lithium, there has been this discovery of, of uh, apparently an important amount in, the, in Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia. Uh -huh. uh, and everything seems to, to, to point out that that will be rather exploited and, and deepening the, the primary dependency of these countries uh, and the foreign control of these resources. So it, in that case, it, it wouldn't be really like the scenario where, where these countries can actually change their uh, bargaining position. Uh, and if the Global North is not willing to, <laughs> to accept what for me, at least uh, ethically and, and in, a, in terms of justice would seem uh, uh, yeah. appropriate to, to, ar to ar arrive to a, some equality sort of level of carbon emission per capita, let's say. Uh, but it, as you said, and it seems politically not feasible. So where, where in, that, in that space uh, do you think that, uh, if, you, if you can further up uh, some, some why, why ideas? Why I was optimistic, yeah. 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 <laughs> No, I mean, I mean, this uh, malediction, la, la venas abiertas de Latinoamérica, it's really, again, uh, the malediction of being the raw material exporter is so, so at the heart of Latin America also that it's, it's really the example of lithium is very important. Um, I think my, uh, I, I must say that probably this is the, again, n n my optimism is not very well grounded. Uh, the only thing that I see is that I try to imagine what are the scenarios that does, do not bring us to the normal standard business as usual scenario where those who have power have no incentive to reallocate a little bit of the power and the wealth to others. Um, I think that the re to, to some extent the rivalry between China and the U.S., could bring Europe to think that maybe a strategy would be better if they tried to build a new and fairer uh, system to some extent. That was my bet that we might try and convince uh, wealthy uh, and powerful European players 
to play a different game because else anyway, uh, between China and Russia, they have no future. So maybe trying to negotiate for purely instrumental reasons and cynical reasons with Africa and Latin America, another uh, terms of, of, of trade. But that's a very conceptual answer. Uh, it's the only one that I can do because I have two, mi I'm two minutes late. But this is also very conceptual. This is the only, it's conceptual, but it's, the only, it's my only hope that there might be uh, something behind that. Maybe you're the, what you were just mentioning about the pandemics is might be also in the end. Uh, I mean, I see Madame Merkel saying uh, no to uh, giving up the, the license on, on, on vaccines, which is just what Biden and Macron had asked. Not that Biden and Macron are better than Merkel, but she has the, <laughs> she has the wealth. Uh, so this is not this is really just uh, disappointing. But I'm not sure that after all we see of the pandemics that does not stop, uh, maybe there will be some understanding that this is a global public good that we are talking about. And so just keeping the money is not going to be, to be feasible. The, these are another, the, the other hope is that the pandemics might continue to change a little bit the understanding of why we need to be more cooperative and to rebalance the economic system. Thanks a lot for your questions. You I mean, uh, that was really great.